Hi, Tati. Hi, Naomi. How's everything going? Good. So we're going to be talking about two of my favorite brothers. Besides from my two brothers, two brothers in the past, uh, Reb Zusha and Reb Limelech, two of the students of the Magad of Mizrich. We talked last time about the Magad of Mizrich, the um, second Hasidic rabbi who lived about 250 years ago and his two students who uh, were very interesting personalities, both of them. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today, which I'm very much looking forward to because I love them both and especially Reb Zusha. Yes, yes, amazing. Okay, so great. Let's start with Reb Zusha. Um, if there's just like sort of one story that comes to mind, just to sort of set, that is a mm. memorable story that sort of sets about his character that you'd like to share. Oh, there's so many stories. Once, once we start with the stories, we'll never get to anything else. Right. But yes, the stories are really the most important part of Reb Zusha. So, um, the, the most, maybe the most famous of his stories, and we'll tell quite a few of them today, is that he would say that after I die and I get up to heaven, and they interview me, the intake interview, they're not gonna ask me, why weren't you like Moshe Rabbeinu? Why weren't you like Moses? Or why weren't you like Abraham? Or why weren't you like Rabbi Akiva? They're gonna ask me, why weren't you like Reb Zusha? Mm. In other words, everybody has to live to their own potential, not to somebody else. A lot of times we look at somebody else and what they have or what they've accomplished. But we should be looking inward and saying, what is it that I need to do f to be myself, the best version of myself, not the version that somebody else has for me or for themselves. So that's one of the most famous little sayings. Uh, another really sweet one is Reb Zusha always addressed himself by referring to himself as Reb Zusha. So he would say Reb Zusha is hungry. He wouldn't say, I'm hungry. Never referred to himself in first person. And the other thing is he didn't really necessarily think or recognize the, the service of when he finally did have a little bit of help where he had an attendant that's called a shamish, like a, um, or a gabai, somebody who would assist him as a rabbi when he got older. He didn't say, good morning, can you please serve me breakfast? I'm hungry to his attendant. Instead, he would just say, Rabbi Nishlailam Zusha is hungry, which means master of the world, Zusha is, Zusha is hungry. Please send him something to eat. And this irritated his attendant because the attendant said, it's not God giving him the food. I'm the one preparing the food every day. And he decided he was going to teach his Rebbe a lesson and he wouldn't prepare food for him the next day. So Zusha would say, Zush is hungry, God give him something to eat. And guess what? Nothing is gonna come out. Mm -hmm. And that's in fact, what happened that the, the attendant that didn't prepare the food and Reb, Reb Zusha said, Zusha is hungry. God send him something to eat, nothing happened. And then Reb Zusha said it again, Zusha is hungry. God sent Reb Zusha something, Zusha something to eat. All of a sudden, there was a knock on the door. Zusha said, come in. And it was a man who had trays of the most lavish, delicious breakfast imaginable. And the Gabi said, and, and, and the Gabi said, what is this? And the man said, um, a year ago, Reb Zusha blessed me and my, my wife to have a child and we had a child and we're so happy we wanna repay the Rebbe with something, a nice breakfast today. 
in honor of having a child. And Reb Zusha said, he didn't even thank the man. He said, master of the world, thank you for the food. And then he made a bracha and he ate. So that was the, maybe a little irritating for some of the people around him, but that was the simplicity of his faith. He was always talking to God. Mm. And then one other story along this conversation he would have with God is one Shabbos, one Sukkot, he was invited to the sukkah of a contemporary named Rabbi Yeva. Rabbi Yeva was more stern than Rabbi Zusha. Rabbi Zusha was humble and loving and, and, and Rabbi Yeva was known for his strict keeping of the law, no nonsense. Not that Rabbi Zusha was lax, but Rabbi Zusha was just known to be loving and, and, and his faith was on another level. So Zusha said, please just, I'll sleep on the ground of your sukkah. I don't need a bed. I don't need blankets. I don't need a pillow. I'm a simple person. Don't worry about me. And Yeva said, okay, but don't make trouble for me because Zusha was known to sometimes make trouble. They go to sleep and it's in, I don't know, Poland or the Ukraine or wherever it is, um, wherever Bieva is, because he was he, he, he was a wanderer at that time. Mm -hmm. So Rup Zusha says, Zusha is cold. Please make it warmer. He's not take, talking to Rebjeva, he's talking to God. Mm. And all of a sudden, a warm waft of air comes into the sukkah. And a minute goes by and Zusha says, Master of the world, thank you so much for bringing in some warm air. I appreciate it. But Zusha is still cold. Could you make it a little warmer? And sure enough, a little more warm air comes in. And again, Zusha says, thank you. Thank you so much, but I'm still cold. Zusha is still cold. He didn't say I. Zusha is still cold. Please make it even warmer. And this time, Rebjevo has taken off one of his blankets and it gets even warmer. And, so, and Rebjevo takes off another one of his blankets because he had 10 blankets. This keeps going on and on for like 20 minutes. Susha keeps thanking God and asking for it to be warmer. In the meantime, Rebjevo has taken off all of his blankets and he's perspiring. He's, he's sweating from the heat in the sukkah. And he shouts at Susha, enough, you're going to burn down my sukkah. And that was it. So she stopped asking for it to be warmer. But the Hasidim would say that if only Rabbi Yeva wouldn't have stopped Rabbi Zusha, he could have warmed up the whole world. He could have warmed up the whole world. So that's the sweetness of absorption, his faith and his, the miracles that would just follow him because of his almost childlike innocence and purity that he, he, he embodied. Mm -hmm. Those, those are some stories. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. Yes, it really uh, definitely illuminates. Um, I guess next, um, speaking of course, last time we spoke about the Maggot of Mestridge, and of course, uh, Reb Zusha, both Reb Zusha and Reb Elimelech, the brothers were uh, one of the most prominent students of the Megadev Masrij. So I was wondering if you wanted to speak specifically about something that really uh, connects a connection between the Megadev Masrij and Reb Zusha, that you know, some a teaching or, or something that maybe the Reb Zusha really took from the Magad, um, or something of that nature. Well, here's, here's one thing that there's different things we learn from teachers. Usually we, we learn through information, through listening to what they have to say. But with Reb Zusha, things worked out very differently. Um, this is actually, if you look in the Wikipedia, they made a mistake. They got this totally wrong, so they need to correct that. But this is the right version. The other students of Reb Zusha would uh, of the of the Magadim Rich would listen to the Magad teach, and they would learn. 
whatever the Maggid said. But Reb Zusha, when as soon as the Maggid would open up his mouth and would say, and the Eibishter had gesagt, God said, Reb Zusha would start getting very excited and excitable and said, God spoke. And then he would redouble his statements, says, God spoke. And then he would start shouting and yelling and he would roll around in ecstasy that God is speaking. But nobody could stand the commotion because they, as, as beautiful as it was, they couldn't hear their Rebbe, the Magad, talking. So they would carry him out of each lecture. So all of the years of the Magad of Ms. Rich talking, Reb Zusha couldn't really get past the first few words because of the inspiration that it, when he heard the Magad speak, it, it went into the essence of who he was and he couldn't handle that light to, to stay and listen to everything else. So sometimes that's even higher because we can hear so many words and yet hmm. it's like uh, another uh, teaching of the Kutzka Rebbe when he was told that a certain young rabbi was brilliant and had studied the Talmud uh, 10 times, gone through the Talmud 10 times. Well, he asked that, that young scholar, he said, but how many times did the Talmud go through you? You went mm -hmm. through the Talmud, but you stayed the same pretty much. Did the Talmud go through you and change who you are? Mm -hmm. and so the, the words of his teacher went through him and changed just, just two words, just two words. God speaking changed who Zusha was. Mm -hmm. So it's so important because today we have what they call AI. It's all about, mm -hmm. it's language machines. Mm -hmm. But it's not the language machines are learning algorithms, but nothing is really being. It's it's not an internal process. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to emulate machine learning by becoming models of information that doesn't touch our soul. Mm. It doesn't motivate us from a place of divinity oneness and we have to relearn to be more like zusha not just to hear the words but let the word penetrate into the depth of who you are mm. wonderful and, yes thank you yes. what do you take away from that story oh i just think that's um yeah, I think that's beautiful and just speaks to this. It's just a simple thing like that. Um, you know, it speaks to the warmth, which I think is very important that you bring up about a figure like Reb Zusha that is not just the, you know, staying to the technique of Halakha is important too, but like the warmth and just the appreciation of everything, saying everything is from Hashem and then appreciating yeah. such a even though it's such a simple thing, it's just two words, but really when you think about it, it is so vast and special every time Hashem speaks. So so that appreciation in language and uh, appreciating the power of language of every word, uh, I think that's a great lesson. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I guess that would be great to move on to, um, we can talk about Rabbi, uh, uh, excuse me, Rabbi Eli Melech, um, Rabbi Zosh's brother, and some of his contributions. Um, yeah, so if you'd like to speak about, you know, what is some major uh, contributions uh, to Hasidicism that um, of Rebbe Eli Melech, that, uh, you know, some of the ones he's most known for, his, you know, most memorable teachings. Mm. So uh, let's, 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 talk about the personality first and because the personality but both of these two brothers were personalities so Zusha mm -hmm. you have a lot of stories about very lovable mm -hmm. but the Melech was slightly more awe-inspiring than than love but they were two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. but what Rabbi Limelech started what he's widely credited with starting is the spread of Hasidism into 
what was then called Poland. Um, actually, I don't know the the, the 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 names of those areas were constantly shifting, but it was a very large area that he influenced by the force of his personality and the charisma that he and and the saintliness that he lived that the top future Hasidic rabbis of the movement that would transform Poland into a stronghold of Hasidism, a place where the majority of the Jews became Hasidic, were his students. So the, the most famous amongst them is the seer of Lublin. But it wasn't just Rebbe Melech, it was also his brother. I think he met Reb Zusha before he met Rebbe Melech. He met Reb Zusha. They, and then they got him to actually visit the Magid for a short time, their teacher, but he was very young. And then he was sent back. The, I, I think it was too hard. And he, he studied with different Rebbe's, but he was very serious. Uh, he studied, I think, with Shmuel Schmelka of Nicholsburg, another contemporary of Reb Zusha. And then they said, send him back to where he started from, to Rebbe Limelech and to Reb Zusha, because that's what he needs. He needs the warmth of Reb Zusha and the passion of Rebbe Limelech to like mold him into a Rebbe that he became. And he was a great Rebbe. He was a powerful Rebbe. And, and it was Rebbe Limelech that, that taught him how to be a Rebbe, along with a little bit of Reb Zusha as well, like I mentioned. Uh, others included um the let me see who some of the others were were there some teachings specifically that that what you would ascribe as that come to mind as particularly influential that had that power um that yeah. that uh, Rabbi Eli Melech's in you know influencing so many people in you know what that X area at that time, whatever it was called, of Poland, of that region, of, into Hasidism. Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I'll come back to some of his other students, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll answer that question first of, of what are his his major contribution that may have led to the spread of Hasidism. And, and it, it's a little a little understood, so we can try to explain it a little bit better. But the academic world, correctly, but, but incorrectly in, in, in much of how they understand the details of it, um, is it credits Rebbe Limelech with introducing the, the concept and the power of the tzaddik, the righteous person, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. focus being on the tzaddik. So that's mm -hmm. kind of well known academically that that's the the contribution of Rebbe Limelech. That's what he writes about in his famous uh, Sefer book called Noam Limelech, the Sweetness of Elimelech. And and therefore they credit him not always positively with the rise of the cult of the personality of the emphasis on how amazing the Rebbe is and his mystical abilities and his magical abilities. And, and there's truth in that, that the, that the Rebbe, uh, Rebbe Limelech introduced the focal point of Hasidism, not just being the Hasidim or the teachings of Hasidut or the kindness of, 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 of a Hasid or the, or the Simcha of a Hasid or the Devekus, the longing or the cleaving to God of a Hasid, but did put the, the Tzaddik which would ostensibly be the rabbi in the center. But that's an oversimplification. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, that's assuming that he invented the concept of a tzaddik. He, no, he just reinvented it. He didn't invent very much at all. Mm -hmm. um, he, he I'll, I'll tell you what he invented, but it wasn't the, the sense that the tzaddik is central. It might have been making him central to Hasidism, but it wasn't him that invented the centrality of the Hasid, uh, of the Tzaddik. In Talmud and Kabbalah, there is the concept that even a divine decree can be revoked by, uh, by a Tzaddik. Yeah. So 
as as early as the Bible, the Chumash, you have ar- arguments where Moses gets the better of God. And it's not something that most non-Jews really understand. How, how could a human argue and win against God? It doesn't make any sense to most people. If after all, God is perfect, mm. God is infinite, man is flawed, mm. How could Moses win an argument with God? Mm-hmm. It doesn't make any sense to them. And the Talmud already talks about, well, that's that's part of what God wants. Mm-hmm. He, wa- he wants to enter into a relationship with us where he can sometimes say, Nitzchuni b'ni, that my son has won, was as like, like, like a, like a, parent who would like the child to do the right thing but sometimes the child has a count what has another perspective that the parent mm-hmm. doesn't have and it's it's hard in the beginning because we know our children are wrong mm-hmm. <laughs> but maybe sometimes they're not wrong we want them occasionally to be right even if that means we're wrong mm-hmm. and 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 that's already in the Talmud. That's already in Kabbalah. So that, like, kind of creating that role of the tzaddik is not really correct in attributing it to him. Yes, he may have recreated it. He may have put it front and center in some of the Hasidic movement, not all. But, mm-hmm. but what I think his real contribution is, mm-hmm. is talking about how close we can be to a tzaddik, mm-hmm. how what what a tzaddik can kind of pull on the divine realm and and bring down the access points of of divinity into the world to create blessing, to mm-hmm. create health, to create well being, to create uh, a opening of the heart. We also have that relationship with a tzaddik. And again, that concept is already existing in the works, and not already because they were contemporaries of, let's say, the Tanya of the Alter Rabbi of Chabad, um, to some degree, the, the writings of the Arizal as well. So it's not, it's not totally new, but the way he set it up, that's what really created the new tzaddik was the relationship of the smaller tzaddikim to the bigger tzaddik, the regular people to the tzaddik. It was, mm-hmm. it was, the, it was the relationship of what we have to one another through the tzaddik that recreated the centrality of the tzaddik. I say recreated because it was already there in, in earlier uh, Jewish texts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think that really illuminates and clarifies um, what it was in that particular topic that really was more uh, close to the, the truth, the accuracy, I guess, of Reb Susha, I mean, excuse me, Reb uh, Eli Melech's, uh contribution uh, regarding the topic of the Tzadik. So in, you know, regards to history and how things are taken. Um, so I'm glad you shared that. And uh, I, coming back to the topic of uh, his influence on his students, um, I would love if um, just any particular story of any of Reb Elimelech's students that come to mind about, um, you know, yeah, a story like about his uh, a relationship or a connection or something that he once made with, you know, one of his students that. Uh, you'd like to share that, you know, that is uh, one, a story you enjoy personally? Or... So, so this, this is the story of when I mentioned before, but just to continue with this, this, this um, particular tremendous student of Rebbe Lemelech and Reb uh, it was the seer of Lublin. The seer is like a, another word for a visionary, like almost like a prophet. So when the seer of Lublin was almost ready to become his own Rebbe, mm-hmm. Rebbe Lemelech said, there's 
something that I want to teach you. Mm -hmm. But I think my brother Abzusha will teach you even better than I can. So please go visit my brother. Mm -hmm. So the seer of Lublin goes and visits his brother, Abzusha, and he says, I've been sent by your brother to finish getting me ready for what it is to be my own Rebbe. Mm -hmm. So Abzusha says to him, let me ask you something. If you see somebody sinning, maybe you see them violating the Shabbos, let's say, what do you, what do you tell them? So the seer of Leblin says, you know, I would be polite to them. I'd be nice to them. I said, look, I, I respect you. I think you're a good person. But there's something that I think you can use some improvement on. And then I would point out what it is that they did and how they could learn to correct it and not do it again. Say, so maybe you didn't know. And if you did know, I don't think you realize how important the Shabbos is. And you should really try to not do that. Yeah. But he saw that Ramzusha wasn't happy with his answer. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, so what would you do? So Ramzusha said, I wouldn't tell them anything about what they did being wrong. He said, instead, I'd shine a light into their soul mm -hmm. about how awesome Shabbos is. Mm -hmm. And God willing, they'll feel the greatness of Shabbos and automatically they'll want to keep the Shabbos. Mm -hmm. So that's, I believe, Melech and Rebzusha, how they trained a future tremendous leader of the Jewish people who would have tens of thousands of chassidim of his own, including many great leaders, uh, they, the seer of Lublin. So that's one such story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. That's really, it's a uh, simple, but yet it, it, um, it really draws out a lot um, of wisdom, I think. So I love those type of simple anecdotes, but you know, that in its simplicity really you. Uh, yeah. are so, you know, uh, something so worth keeping in mind. Um, and also just shows also that, a, a humility, I guess, of Rabbi Ali Melech, that he was, he wanted to share this like very special value that he knew his brother, this wisdom mm -hmm. and share so well. Um, so I think that is perfect because it brings me to what I, it would be my last question would be, you know, a little anecdote or story about uh, specifically a, a story with Reb Zusha and uh, Reb Ali Melech, both brothers, just any story that really, something about that, draw something out that you like about the relationship that we can learn from anything that comes to mind, I would love to know. They definitely loved and respected each other. Something we could we could learn and 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 I could learn from, you could learn from mm -hmm. about how to respect one another, our siblings. They they uh, used to travel together. Mm -hmm. Yes. Before they became rebbies, they were very poor, especially a Zusha, and they would just go from place to place. And I'll tell you a few stories about their travels because that's some of the most beautiful stories is when they were on the road together as two brothers. So one, one story is that they would spend the night in different places and legend has it is that every town that they would spend the night, it would eventually become a Hasidic town. Mm. But there was one town that they went to the inn and they couldn't fall asleep. They tossed and they turned and they had terrible visions. They said, there's something very dark here. We can't spend the night here. And they packed up and they left before dawn. Mm -hmm. And that town was Ushpitzin, now known as Auschwitz. Mm. So they had just intuitively felt the darkness there. In fact, sadly enough, Ushputsin was, I think, a city of 3,000 people. Mm 
I don't know, a city, a town of 3,000 people, half a shtetl, half of which were Jewish, before it became known as the biggest extermination camp of Jews. And many of them were Hasidic. But that's the story of Reb Zusha and Reb Melech not being able to spend the night in Rishpitzin 150 years before the right. infamous Auschwitz. Right. Another story on their travels is poor Reb Zusha. They were traveling and sometimes they would go to like a hostel, equivalent of a hostel where you'd sleep Mm -hmm. uh, in a big room mm -hmm. near the fire, but there were other people in the room who would also sleep in other corners of the room. Maybe that also would serve as the bar. So if somebody came in late and wanted a drink, they'd be having a drink while you tried to sleep. So there were a bunch of Cossacks, something, some rough crowd, mm -hmm. like the equivalent of a biker gang, uh, mm -hmm. having, having shots and just mm -hmm. partying. And they wanted to entertain themselves. So they kept on taking Reb Zusha away from his place that he was sleeping and making him dance and just forcing him to dance. And it was humiliating. And uh, I don't know if they were, you know, shooting near his feet to make him dance like they, like they do in the Westerns or whatever they were doing was was beyond degrading. Oh. And they kept doing this and kept doing right. this. And his brother, Abli Melech, says, I feel so bad. We'll switch places. So that way, the next time, they'll take me. So they switch places when, the, when these Cossacks are not looking. And then one Cossack says to the other, let's take the Jew again to dance. But he says, let's take the other Jew. It's time for the other Jew to dance. So they take Reb Zusha again because he had switched place and they didn't really, they made him dance again. So that's that story. They thought the same Jew was the other Jew. <laughs> yes, yes, because they had switched places. So they thought they were taking the other one. <laughs> but here's here's a very powerful, so maybe one of my favorite stories mm -hmm. is they they, they, was, they put them in jail. There was a few times Reb Zusha went to jail. For example, one time, he had this money and it was the same. It, it, it was his money, but there was some woman or man that had said they had lost that same amount. So what he did is he said, oh, I found the money, but I'm going to keep as a reward a large sum of it. I'll give away 85, 90 percent of it, but 10 percent I'm keeping as an award. So they beat him and they put him in jail. And and it was his money. So they said, why are you, why are you um, hurting yourself? Why did you either yeah. not just give them, say, I, 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 I can give you, it's my money, I'll give it to you, or, or just give them all the money. It's not worth the headache. He kept, you know, a few hundred dollars, but got beaten up and put in jail for it wasn't worth yeah. it. So Sasha says, there's one thing I'm not going to take is I'm not going to be praised. I don't like, I'm going to, I'm not like, I'm going to do, right gonna do a thing. good thing in a I'm way that is it different. Yeah. kind of a That's dirt bag, the way that makes people go, oh, that was kind of a dirt baggy way. He doesn't want it to be too honorable. Exactly. And it's the opposite <laughs> of what, you know, what the, what the world is all about now is everyone's doing everything to be recognized and praised because of what it is. Or they, they take too much credit for something they had a little bit to do with. They, they, they pretend they did all of it or. Well, don't share. So that was, he was the epitome of humility, epitome of kindness without taking credit. But there's another story. This is the one I was getting to this, like one of my favorites. Say he's traveling with his brother and whatever reason they, somebody, something was stolen in the end that they were staying. And so right away, they threw the, those two into jail before investigating. Eventually they would be free. But in the meantime, they're in the jail. And back then they, there was no running water. So for a toilet, you either went outside and in an outhouse and you, you, yeah. you, you relieved yourself, but because it was a jail and they didn't let them out, there was a chamber pot. A chamber pot is basically like a porta potty mm -hmm. without the chemicals in it that you right. believe yourself in. Right. And there's no chemicals and there's no thing. It, it, it stank like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. So it was time to pray and you, you can't pray when there's a, a chamber pot. 
you know, right. with its disgusting, it smells, right. and it's not a lot of prey in there. So they, the two brothers turned to one another and said, this is going to be a little hard because we want to pray and we can't pray. But before either of them could get depressed about it, probably Rabbi Zisha told to his brother, Rabbi Lehmelech, he says, well, look, the same God who says pray, says not to pray when there's a chamber pot. So we're actually worshiping God by not praying. Mm -hmm. And they started dancing because they realized they're also, this is not praying is a way of doing God's will. And that should make you be happy to do God's will. And they just got so excited and they started dancing around the chamber pot. Now, the other inmates were kind of bored. So they started dancing with them, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. And, oh, and eventually, yeah. when the guards saw that they were dancing around the, cha the chamber pot, they said, let's take the chamber pot out because it's making them too happy. They didn't oh, want them to be happy. So they took it out and they were able to pray. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. So there's a lot. There's a lot of great stories and, and there's great teachings. This this uh, this safer I have here, uh, the Gnome of the Mouth, it really chronicles in great detail. It, it takes an earlier idea, like I mentioned before, that uh, it's one of the ideas uh, the foundation is mostly in the Zohar uh -huh. which talks about how how all of like the soul of a person is part of God's name particularly when a person reaches obtains a high level of righteousness what we call it tzaddik they're manifesting divinity in in who they are that's that's that they're, they're communicating with god it's not just that god is outside of them talks to them like you hear a voice from outside of you it's an internal process of the divine within communicating to the divine without it's a it's, it's that process is called the unification of the different it's it's the realization of the concept of, of God saying, let us make man in, in the image of the divine, that that likeliness of the divine allows for communication, allows for not just prophecy, but like two-way street. You connect with God, you bring up, you elevate something in the world and bring it up, and then it also comes down. And that's the concept in the Stohar. But what Rabbi Lee Melech in the Nomali Melech in his book is able to do with that is to flesh that out and, and have hundreds of pages basically explaining what that means, explaining almost the whole Torah, many or many verses or many, many chapters of the Torah with concepts like that and how it relates to drawing down, changing the world, what one tzaddik, the different levels of different tzaddikim and what they each are able to accomplish, and it's a whole book. I, I, I can't really summarize it in on one foot. I think we, we're just something that is worthwhile to study, especially today where where we don't where we don't have heroes anymore. It's very hard to have heroes. Mm. It's almost like if you look in the world of martial arts. <laughs> yeah. Right. When I was young, he, my my favorite my favorites were Chuck Norris, Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. and Steven Seagal, mm -hmm. and Van. You know, so it's like okay. And then what's his what's his name? Bruce Lee died, and then you have like Steven Seagal, and you have all these people trash talking him. Oh because, really? Oh yeah, for sure. Because. You know, I think he's talented, but he's he's gotten overweight. He he likes to exaggerate. He's 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 got he's got Do he's he, not Bruce perfect. Lee he's older older. What? Bruce Lee and his like no. older no or no Steven Steven Seagal has been around for too long. Oh, okay, his, you're talking about Steven Seagal to be, to be worshipped. Right. He, his flaws have been exposed, so it's almost like. We know so much about everyone today in the social media age that yeah. I, maybe he's not a good example. But, but the, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because it's hard. We know everybody's flaws, unless they are, are even better at covering it up than others. So it, it's it's harder today to like say this person is really a tzaddik. And and also nobody really wants to have anyone over them. 
And the whole idea of a tzaddik isn't to be over. It's really just to inspire us. And I, mm -hmm. I'm so glad that in it's my lifetime. It's to, it's to bring, it's not to say, you know, Hashem and spirituality is something that is so high above humanity to be unaccessible and make us feel small, but rather that, you know, to bring it to our level in a way that we can understand it. It's a uniting thing. So it's a, it has to be a humble figure. It can't be a person who sees themselves as, you know, isolated from the masses. It has to be somebody who can come and bring it to within the masses. So yeah, the and, and it's, it's the humility. It's the, their humility is the is is the vehicle that makes them so great. It's it's the combination of their connect their devotion, their connection to God, their devotion to people and love of people, and the Torah and the humility that 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 gives them that. And and um, there, there's great tzaddikim that have been around, and it's a it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a little bit harder today, mm -hmm. but uh, we should connect ourselves to tzaddikim both uh, living and those who are no longer in the world to be inspired with. And the, uh, the sweetness that they have and the beauty and the humility and the awesomeness should be inspirations for us to, to live by. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Um, yeah. I think that says it perfectly. So. What is it that you think? What is it that you think that you could take out uh, if you could take out a couple, one or two or three points from Reb I, I really What's your want to echo, you know, that last point that you just illustrated about the type of individuals that we, as you know, society sort of hold up, and that we should try to find, you know, really the true meaning of exotic and try to find not put people on pedestals to sort of idealize them and also in the same way it hurts though these individuals we see this like with celebrity and stuff to sort of isolate them and put them in a in a cage but rather get inspiration from heroes who um are heroes in the ways that they unite us and bring us together in in greater purposes and, and it's about that love of humanity and to sort of um exalt and venerate those sort of traits in an individual instead. So, sure. Nice. Yeah. Okay, well, this has been great. So glad that we're able to uh, talk yeah. about these two great brothers and hopefully you'll send, say hello to your sister and brother on that note. On that note, <laughs> yes. love you yes. so much. Okay, okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. Right.